everybody. Welcome to ABA Inside Track, the podcast that's like reading in your car, but safer. I'm your host, Robert Perry Cruz, and with me as always are my fabulous co-hosts. Hello, Rob. It's Diana. And it's me, your best friend, Jackie. Hey, bestie. Hey, besties. You claim to be a best friend, but but that seems like a very hard skill set to have. How how would you come about in learning all the skills related to being a best friend? You know, it's a hard skill. It's really complex to be a bestie. And I think that we should turn to some curricula to help us tease apart what would mean what it would mean to be a bestie. Thank you for being a friend. <laughs> Travel around the road and drive down the road and back again. All right, all right. Before we start getting into old 80s TV theme songs, I want to remind the listeners they're actually listening to a podcast about behavior analysis and behavior analytic research, where every week we pick a topic in the field and discuss some research on that topic. And like Jackie was so beautifully hinting, this week we're going to be talking about social skills, but not just social skills. We're actually going to be delving into the world of social skills curricula. Ooh, we've certainly done some episodes before where we talked about specific skill deficits and how behavior analysts have, you know, taught certain skills. We talked about like college social skills, mostly focusing on teaching skills for individuals with autism. But we never have talked about a kind of a comprehensive system. We've talked about comprehensive research, comprehensive methods and procedures, but never a comprehensive teaching of all the little itty bits of technique that leads to developing what one would consider the all-encompassing socialization ability of an individual. For me, I think it seems like not, it doesn't seem as whole or complex, I guess, when you say socialization ability. I don't know why. I don't like that. <laughs> but I don't, yeah, I don't maybe think that's getting at the right thing. Right. Because I think, I think it's more about looking at social competence, potentially, and like, learning the skills around because it's not just about communicating right but it's about like interpreting the complex social cues around so don't say something say something leave don't leave (laughs) it's like very complex i agree it's super complex and it can even be hard i think to fully operationalize some of those nuanced aspects of how one interacts socially which is why it can be difficult for someone who's maybe looking at it from the outside to figure out some of these social skills Yeah, I agree. And I think, you know, the literature doesn't really give us a a really good starting point as like, what's the definition of social skills, right? Because everybody kind of names it differently. So we'll be talking about four articles tonight that get into all of the nitty gritty of social skills and how they might be able to be taught using a more standardized curricular approach rather than looking at individual skills. Those articles are A Meta-Analysis of School-Based Social Skills Interventions for Children with Autism Spectrum Disorders by Bellini, Peters, Benner, and Hope from Remedial and Special Education, 2007. Follow that up by A Review of Social Skills Manuals for Adolescents with Autism Spectrum Disorder by Hall, Leinert, and Jaquez from Current Developmental Disorders Reports, 2018. And from that, we're going to be kind of delving back and looking at, you know, spoiler alert, the two curricula around social skills for individuals with ASD that had the largest body of research. Again, not necessarily what we would consider enough research to say these are you know fully evidence-based, fully endorsed curricula, but they have the most studies on the topic of whether they work or not. So we're going to be discussing the two kind of most prominent, at least in that developing field, the peers curriculum and the social competence intervention curriculum. And so we'll be looking at two of their earlier studies by actually the authors of those curricula, evidence-based social skills training for adolescents with autism spectrum disorders, the UCLA peers program by Logason, Frankel, Gantman, Dillon, and Mogul from the Journal of Autism and Developmental Disorders 2012, and social competence intervention for elementary students with Asperger's syndrome and high-functioning autism by Stichter, O'Connor, Herzog, Lernheimer, and McGee from the Journal of Autism and Developmental Disorders, also 2012. So why don't we start by discussing what are the concerns related to individuals with autism when related to social skill development? Kind of kind of a broad topic. And I think for most of you out there, especially practitioners, you probably can list them off and say, oh, I, you know, I know what those are. I work, you know, I work with individuals who are, you know, improving on these skills every day. But 
just in case, let's kind of go through some of the you know, larger skill deficits that typically make up areas of weakness for individuals with ASD related to social skills. Sure. Well, when you take a look at these curricula, as we will, that's what we're going to get to, you'll see it mentioned time and again that individuals with this diagnosis tend to have more difficulty in social relationships, sometimes making friendships, sometimes even the skills of just day-to-day social interactions, which are for the most part, required, unless you figure out how to order pizza online, like I have, there are several times in which you might need to interact with someone during the day. So there's a whole range and gamut of things that are going to fall into these categories of social skills. And many of these curricula are going to start with the less complex skills, such as those types of conversational skills, and then move on into more complex friendship and relationship skills, which are would be kind of down down the road. And I think that we could talk forever about the things that are going to be categorized underneath the umbrella of social skills. And I know when I talk later about the peers program, I'll tell you what they included there, which is a pretty, not a, and it's hard to say you're ever going to be comprehensive here, right? But it covers a lot of ground. But I think that it's also important when you think about what are the limitations of these types of social skills curricula. When we think about there's a balance here. Skills that are things that if you're a neurotypical person, you're used to seeing as part of social interaction that may or may not be the functional core of that social interaction. It may in fact be more related to our social culture in which we live. And I think trying to parse apart what are the components of social interaction that anyone needs to know in order to either get their needs met through a social exchange, or if it is important for them to make and maintain friendships, what are the component skills of that that are necessary versus what are the skills that just come along for the ride as being sort of social niceties or our expectations regarding eye contact or handshakes or engaging in small talk that we come to expect as part of social skills, but that may may not actually be critical to the social interaction. So Many of these curricula have what I would consider to be both of those components kind of packaged in together. And until we think long and hard about which of those is really functionally critical, we may end up teaching components that someone who's autistic would look at that list and say, I don't think that this is actually that relevant of a social skill for me or a skill that I necessarily want to build. Jackie? Yeah, I think that's really good. And I think We really need to think about, like, do we need to teach eye contact? Probably not, right? I think if we teach orientation and we teach initiation and we teach, you know, taking turns in conversation and, you know, staying on a topic that may not be interesting to you, right, because the other person is interested, I think those are things that are probably more functionally beneficial than And then what we typically would describe as like teaching eye contact or, you know, that sort of thing. I think when we're talking about the social skills that probably are most important, while we certainly have have listed a number of them and and it's debatable as to which ones are most important, least important, important to others, but not to the individual. We do want to keep in mind the general finding that so many individuals with ASD, regardless of having so many other areas of success do tend to, often because of social skill deficits, become either depressed or isolated later on in life, which makes it harder for for them to finish college, for them to get jobs that are commensurate with their actual overall abilities in the workplace, maintain some of those jobs. So the nice thing about a lot of the curricula we're talking about today is it is geared more towards, I think, the skills of interaction with others and specifically more towards the upper elementary adolescent level, which does include, I think, skills that everyone would agree. And like, I think you already mentioned a number of them, Diana, the idea of being able to maintain a conversation, feign interest in a conversation that you might not want to continue having, end the conversation appropriately, make sure to you know, learn how to engage with someone. So it's not just lots of questions or not just lots of comments about your own preferences. It's the give and take of a social interaction and then those more advanced skills related to those reciprocation that is going to be very important in the making and maintaining of friendships. 
And I think for the most part, when we're talking about social skills in these curricula, we are talking about those more friendship skills, as well as a few other skills that are sort of broken down as collateral skills. So why don't we get into the Bellini study? Or Jackie, did you have any other kind of social skill things you wanted to throw in before we move on? No, I think you guys hit it. And I think it's really important to think about what's going to be beneficial now and then what's going to be beneficial as as children age into, you know, adults and workers in society. I think that's something that we sometimes forget. We're like, oh, this is what they could use right now, but it's going to get more complex. So, right, because as we get older, the relationships that we are part of are not as simple as they were, you know, when we were in kindergarten, first grade, and thinking about how we can lay the foundation. So we're building upon skills to capture the complexities of those social interactions at the workplace and, you know, when you are choosing hobbies when when you're, you know, older and out on your own. So we've listed so many different types of skills and we've reviewed research that's looked into various components of social skills and has kind of looked at you know, individual interventions for skill A or skill B related to social skills. So, you know, the reciprocal component of a communication or initiating or changing the topic. And many of those, especially in the behavior analytic research, we've seen some measure of success, sometimes more, sometimes less, definitely a push towards more generalization and maintenance of skills. Some research articles have really focused almost solely on the generalization piece, given that being able to do social skills in a clinic is nice. Being able to do social skills in the rest of your life is what's important. And we'll be looking at, you know, and and I'm I'm always frustrated with is, okay, great. So I I, I have to synthesize every bit of research on social skills ever done and sort of put it together into a coherent whole. And I think that for me is where the idea of social skills, you know, training or social skills programs kind of hit that wall of like, well, which ones am I going to focus on? And then you sort of get bogged down in the analysis of well, what's most important and what does the individual want to do? And there are so many other skills that maybe we're not going to get time to target. And I think that's where the idea of having something that's got a scope and sequence related to social skills, which is so broad, is very tantalizing as something that we could use as practitioners. Just the book that says, here are all the skills here are the procedures that you know from research will usually work. And even better if you're then told, and we actually did all these lessons and they were a slam dunk and they generalized and everyone lived happily ever after. You know, that, that's sort of what we would love to have. We're not quite there, but at least we are able to kind of get started. You know, some of that legwork has been done. Looking at the, the first article, the Bellini article, This article was really great for looking at sort of what exists circa 2007. It was a good review of multiple articles related to social skills. And it's one of those skills, even in 2007, sorry, topics, even in 2007, where I would expect them to have had more to look at in their meta-analysis for children with autism, that you would have had hundreds or thousands of of research articles on social skills. But in this meta-analysis, you really only found 55 that could be looked at to sort of review. And, and it was a limited you know, year size. It was 1980 to 2005. So certainly it was not all of time, but those would be sort of the primary years we'd have expected to see most of this research. And in talking about previous research, you know, there had been work looking at sort of breaking down, how do we break down social skill research and previous work by you know McConnell and colleagues had sort of grouped social skill interventions into five different categories, ones that are focusing on environmental modification. So how do we set up the environment so that social skills just happen? Child-specific interventions, which is sort of the direct instruction that I think a lot of ABA research really focuses on. Collateral skills interventions, which again, similarly, we see a lot of in behavior analysis where we're training related skills, so language skills specifically, or play skills, so skills that will make it easier to socialize later on. They also broke down into peer-mediated interventions, so the use of peers as sort of the interventionists to direct peer with ASD or to respond to them in a certain way. And then comprehensive, which refers to just, we did more than one of these at the same time, which is kind of you know what the whole topic is tonight. And a lot of other research where they've done meta-analyses on social skill training, specifically in schools, when looking at other populations, so either emotional behavioral disorder, children with emotional behavior disorders, some of those children with emotional behavior disorders, and autism, the results are kind of crummy, you know, in terms of looking at single subject designs for children in those categories. (laughs) Well, let's just say that they didn't demonstrate much uh, effectiveness when looking at 
you know, statistically, there, there wasn't a lot of significance in terms of the methodologies demonstrating kind of long-term gains. And very few of them actually looked at the more advanced questions of, well, how are these skills going to be maintained over time? And how do they generalize to other settings? Which I guess makes sense if the results weren't, you know, that strong to begin with. The most thorough lit review, I think, pre- or previous to this one related to social skill instruction was by Gresham in 2001. And, and it's actually, I think it's cited in both the Logos and in this and the Stichter paper later. But the authors really came up with some big, you know, glowing recommendations of nobody's doing this with enough time. You know, 30 hours seems to be like the maximum anyone's ever thought social skills should should take. It probably needs more than 30 hours if you're going to put together a really coherent, comprehensive intervention. That most of the skills seem to be done in settings that aren't producing good maintenance or generalization of the effects. Everything's always in these tiny, contrived situations. It's not contextualized at all. There is rarely an attempt to match what strategy is being used to the deficit of the individual. So not enough work in terms of determining, is this an issue of a student with a skill acquisition deficit, so they just don't know how to do whatever the skill is? Or is it one of kind of a failure to engage in the skill? So the student could do the skill. However, in the most meaningful environments, they do not do the skill, whether it's a choice, whether it's they they don't understand that's the, the setting to use that skill. That is two separate problems that aren't always treated as two separate problems. It is one big problem. And then also, most of the articles published don't take any data on the fidelity of the procedures. So it seems like the question we have tonight of like, what would be a good curricula to use? Most of the research hasn't looked at it with that level of coherence in terms of it's just going to be, we all did some stuff and you could do it too, but we didn't describe enough of what it was. So who knows why this was or was not effective? And I agree with you when you say that, Rob, because I think people are like, okay, this is a huge deficit. Here's what the research before did. Here's how we can you know, modify it slightly to fit what we're looking for, but it's still not the best, but there's still a lot more that we need to do in this area. And I think, you know, I think this is a really important area because this is one of the most common, you know, areas where there are deficits with, you know, autistic children. And also, you know, in the neurotypical world as well, like social skills are hard. (laughs) And, you know, I think Thinking about that from both sides, I think is is helpful because not everyone, even you know, in like first grade or second grade, are demonstrating the skills that you would want them to be demonstrating. Mm-hmm. So, looking over the review, like you said, Jackie, when we're looking at at some of the the summaries from some of these studies, is uh, elementary students didn't fare quite as well as some of the older students, which I think makes sense because, like you said first and second graders have a lot to learn about social skills, regardless of whether they have or do not have a disability. We're all a work in progress, Rob. Exactly. The overall reach of the Bellini paper was articles from 1980 to 2005 that had the participants, specifically children with an ASD diagnosis, the articles had to be talking specifically about a social outcome. So it couldn't be related to problem behavior and then some you know, a couple extra social pieces related to that problem behavior. It was specifically about, did they engage in certain social skills after the study was done? They had to happen in a school, and they had to use a single subject design with individual data points. And it had to be, you know, peer-reviewed journal. It wasn't just, you know, anyone's pamphlet that they wrote up. So again, this was 55 studies were reviewed for this paper. A whole bunch of characteristics reviewed in terms of, you know, how did they describe the intervention that was used? What was the dosage of treatment in terms of like hours, number of sessions? What was the research design, the dependent variables? How effective was the intervention? And not just how effective was it in the completion of the study, but also how did those results look under maintenance? How did they look in terms of generalization? And then a a variety of other pieces, like was there procedural integrity, IOA data, was there any social validity data taken as part of the kind of review of the studies? They looked at individual data points for all of the 157 total participants that were a part of these 55 studies, and they did a non-overlapping data points, like PND. So That seems like a nightmare. It's a lot of data points, right? (laughs) And not just across like baseline to treatment, but if there was a maintenance category, if there was a generalization condition. You had to look there as well. I hope that while they were doing that, they were also watching like good Hallmark movies. I'd assume so. I mean, really, what did you see? Oxymoron. 
So in looking at that, those non overlapping data points, you can sort of get, you know, scores. And depending on what the score is, you're either going to get a very effective or a low effectiveness treatment result. And they did this, you know, in terms of complicated, like you're saying, Jackie, they did it across all participants, all dependent variables in all of the studies for maintenance, for generalization, and for intervention. So, you know, again, and, and that's if they listed anything about differences in persons, settings, stimuli, skills, any of that would go into the generalization bucket. They also looked at the skills as collateral skills, like like we said before, like play skills, conversation skills, sharing, waiting, smiling versus, say, eye contact or joint attention. And then they broke that away from, say, social interaction skills, which would be number of initiations or did the student respond appropriately? What was the level of participation or the duration of interaction? So they really broke everything out into these little component parts. They also did a lot of other statistics. I'm not going to get into all of those. And based on this overall summary, most programs ranged in length from about eight to 73 sessions that took about 2.5 to 28 hours across anywhere from two to 210 days. So that was sort of the range you're looking at. When we talk about 30 hours, maybe not being enough, not a single one of these 55 studies actually used more than 30 hours of intervention. And overall, the results in the Bellini study were similar to previous research that had been summarized in front of the paper, which I always feel sad when I read a paper and I read the whole introduction. I'm like, I can't wait to see the results. And the results are pretty much exactly what they described in all the research they looked at before doing that paper. <laughs> it's like, well, you could have just told me to save my time, sir or madam. Because again, in but terms... They, but they counted all those data points. They went to a lot of work to be like, and our results were pretty much the same as everybody else's. The social skill interventions, again, they looked at schools specifically and students with ASD specifically, which hadn't quite been done before, but, you know, we saw similar results with low to questionable treatment and generalization effects. The only thing that came out as having possibly some moderate effects would be maintenance. So again, it seems like what's being done isn't leading to the results we're looking for, but when it does, the results do seem to have some stability over time. However, very few of the studies really go in depth into their procedure. A lot of them don't have a good procedural integrity. So there's still a lot of questions about, well, could you even replicate this, these findings in these individual studies? You know, the older the student, the better some of the results would be in terms of the follow-up results or the intervention results. They'd be a little bit stronger. It seemed like when students worked in individual groups or in group interventions, there really wasn't a huge difference in, in terms of the overall effectiveness. It was still kind of low to moderate effects. The only area there was any significance was when students worked on social skills in the context of their classroom, rather than in a pullout session, you did see more effectiveness of the intervention. And then, of course, you saw you know, some amount of generalization when that was the case. The older the students had better results. It sort of varied whether preschool or elementary students in some of these studies had worse results, but they never had the best results, which again, makes sense because I think younger children have a harder time with social skills already and they're still developing as individuals. So, you know, many of the skills we think of as social skills just aren't fully there. You know, they aren't fully developed. They haven't had enough time to practice. Yeah. And spoiler alert, my research looks specifically at elementary age students and they said that a lot of times these curricula are not tailored for younger students, right? So they might have a lot of discussion, which might not be helpful for younger students, or, you know, like the reading material or the introduction stuff may not have the specific age level that you need to for younger students. So it would make sense, right? Because unless you're tailoring it specifically for younger students, it probably isn't going to encapsulate what what they could do. So you're going to probably have to heavily modify it. Yeah. There wasn't any real correlation between the number of sessions or the length of time and, and the outcomes, at least nothing significant from the, the statistical analysis. So again, overall, school-based social skills intervention, eh, minimally effective for children with ASD, not great generalization effects, some maintenance effects, so what gets learned does seem to maintain over time. And this really was the same for certain, you know, those collateral skills versus the social skills. I mean, collateral skills tended to do a bit better than social skills, but again, never anything that was statistically significant. So what, what does all of this mean? Give up, there's nothing to be done. Well, the authors then, you know, at least kind of come back around to what should we be looking for in more comprehensive social skill intervention? And certainly one could say, well, maybe it's because it's in the schools and that's not a focus. But when we think about it, where are most children going to learn social skills or targeted social skills? And the answer is, at school, that is where that work is going to be done. And you could certainly do it as sort of private 
pay services after school. You could do a weekend social skills group. And, and those would, could, could certainly be very effective. However, that's not where most children are spending their time. So if we can't get social skills taught in the school setting, I question how much generalization we're going to see long term. You know, how, how much will students be able to make meaningful friendships? Because it's great that they can work with a friend they see once a week. But if they can't then do that when they're at school, six to seven hours a day, you know, is, is it worth that work? Yeah, well, yes. Yes and no, I suppose would be, <laughs> I guess, my answer there. So what should we be looking for in social skills? The Bellini recommendations. Well, probably more time. You know, are the low treatment effects because nobody did any of these interventions with the high enough level of intensity? So again, is it that the interventions are bad or that they weren't done enough? That's always kind of that question. Is it a matter of it's not a good intervention or does it need more time? So a higher dosage. But since 30 hours kind of keeps popping up and none of them hit that 30 hour threshold, I guess it's still unknown how much time needs to be done for social skills to be training to be effective and then to show maintenance. And just for clarification, we're talking about 30 hours total, Mm -hmm. very often spread across several weeks. It's not like 30 hours a week of this. It's 30 hours total. Yes. Thank you, Diana. The setting does seem to be a key component. So settings that are in the more naturalistic environment are going to be overall more effective and demonstrate more generalized ability. So let's do more in-session rather than pull-out social skills training as we can. They come back with the idea of the matching the strategy to the type of skill deficit, which again, it wasn't really clear from the study. Again, was was this ever done? Could this be why the results weren't very good, that we didn't match the deficit to the skill or the strategy being taught? Maybe it's not relevant. Maybe it is relevant. We don't know because none of these studies really made an effort to make that clear, whether that was a, a component of the intervention. Right. And just to build on that, like we're lumping all of these social skills in together, Mm -hmm. right? But there's no indication that all of these skills hang together as a response class. There could be many different reasons why people engage in these behaviors and many reasons why they don't engage in these behaviors. So it's unlikely that we all engage in social skills for the same reason or we engage in particular ones for particular reasons. And those may or may not function in the same way for all people. And then finally, what do we need to know about intervention fidelity, social validity, and components of generalization? Because not enough of the studies really mention this. Only 14 actually had procedural integrity checks in the study. Only 12 looked at social validity as well. And then very few were very clear as to how they expected the skills to generalize, whether that was a component of the study, making it hard to make any broad statements about here are some best practices. The question is not which best practices should you use such as so much as what are the best practices if you want to reach any of the the kind of goals of this research and so that kind of leaves us needing a lot of information and having a lot of area to cover so along comes hall and colleagues with the question that i was so excited someone well, i don't want to say someone finally but at least i could find it in published form in sort of one location of What manuals out there, like who has then looked at social skill development and said, I'm going to put all these skills together. I'm going to make something meaningful that leads to great outcomes and that leads to generalization of skills and lifelong maintenance and just meaningful change, you know, that the the students involved feel happy about and are excited about, the parents are excited about, and the teachers are excited about. And this is where their review of social skills manuals by Hall and colleagues in 2018 comes from that will sort of guide the rest of our discussion today. To some extent, I feel like when we talk about these curricula, we're, we're a little bit putting the cart before the horse in terms of we don't quite know exactly <laughs> what components are the most important. So to then say, look, I made a book of all the components that exist, you sort of have to question, well, is this going to result in just the same amount of meh results overall in terms of overall efficacy? But I think one of the barriers to doing meaningful instruction is, especially in the school setting, is if you give a teacher, here's a curriculum you can use, even if it's not the best curricula, it will more likely be done so we can at least start to gather some research about what worked, what didn't work. Whereas if you're like, here are 10 different strategies you can use to put together your own social skills. It's like, no, I don't think I have time for that. Let's focus on the capitals of, you know, the country we're in. What was included in this review of manuals? Okay, so because the title was Adolescents with Autism Spectrum Disorder, few of the of the manuals had to specifically focus on teaching adolescents with ASD. Although, you know, th- there are other curricula that sort of teach adolescents that also have a, a similar elementary level curricula. They had to 
teach social content that was related to social emotional reciprocity, nonverbal behavior related to socialization, and conversation skills. And they just took that out of, well, that's what the DSM-5 says is a component of getting a, a diagnosis of autism. Therefore, shouldn't the social skills curricula target those decided upon deficits? This also meant that they had to have some sort of content on conversations. It had to have some content on body language or facial expressions and on maintaining and beginning relationships. They wanted to look at what was the format of the instruction of each curricula. They wanted to look at, did these curricula even use evidence-based practices? And to define it as evidence-based, it had to be a part of the National Professional Development Center on Autism Spectrum Disorders list of research-based practices. But that just really included things like, did it have, did it use modeling? Did it use prompting? Did it use reinforcement? So again, th things that we're all very familiar with in terms of best practice, not in terms of directly related to the social skill training best practice. Did other social skills that aren't discussed already get targeted in the curricula? So what, what bonuses came with that curricula? Were there recommendations on the length and frequency of the lessons or activities? Did they list specific generalization strategies? Did they have a scope and sequence, which I would hope so if they're going to call themselves a curricula? Was there any sort of assessment tool included or system to manage behavior? Or the, I don't quite know why this was something that they cared about, but did it have a CD involved? Was one of the components? I like that, though, because it means, do you get materials with it, right? Okay. Then their phrasing of it confused me. I was like, like right. a singing CD? What are they talking about? I think, I mean, they mentioned like thumb drives and worksheets and everything, but I thought that was funny. Yeah, that's what I think they were talking about because I read that too. And I said, yeah, that would be helpful because it's so sad when you buy something like a curricula, but then you have to make all your own materials. Like nobody wants that. No, oh, that's true. Right? That is a good point. Yeah, nobody wants that. Yeah. Also, was there published research on these curricula? So again, all these components of what might make a good curricula. And then there was research to show that this did anything. Of, uh, this had any sort of meaningful result worth publishing about. And of course, you had to be able to buy the curricula, which I think is very important because I really, really hate reading old studies where they're talking about these like programs that have these great results and you try to find them. And it's like, oh, you get them on a secondhand bookstore for like $1,000. It's like, well, I'm not using that. I don't care how good it is. Can't get it. So they had to be able to buy it either at a university store or Amazon. And they had 25 total curricula they were able to look at. And you had to be able to buy it new, I should also say. Couldn't buy it used. So you got to be able to just click, buy it now, had to come through. So we have 25 manuals. And so I'm going to give a little bit of a summary. And then we're going to spend the rest of the episode really talking about the two that sort of came out, kind of rose to the top in terms of most research, which is what we're all about here on the show. So they had 25 manuals. There were a lot of different formats and structures that ranged from, you know, how did they introduce the skills using didactic instruction, modeling, role play activities, games and quizzes, different worksheets that could be used. 68% of the curricula had some sort of a modeling or video modeling component. 60% had components that included positive reinforcement of the target skills. 36% used prompting. And then beyond that, it was sort of a lot of different a lot of different tools being used to create these, these 25 curricula. 72%, fortunately, did have kind of lesson plans. So it was set up as you would expect to see in a curriculum book. Six of the programs said, let's do lessons two to three times a week for 40 to 45 minutes, which is getting close to that you know, total amount of time that had been recommended previously. Uh, some even had five sessions or one to five times sessions weekly for 60 minutes each, five times each. So again, really getting right up to that 30 minutes, if not a little bit beyond. Most of these curricula talked about generalization as doing homework and doing work with parents, which again, is not, not bad. We'll, you will have to, we'll have to see how the results come out to you know, and say whether that is, is going to be meaningful enough generalization, but it is something, at least it was discussed. But of the 25 manuals, only 16 total studies were written looking at participants with ASD who were, again, adolescents, so 13 to 18 years old, evaluating the manuals. And of those 13 studies, they were really all centered around only five of the total available manuals. Of those five, only four had a clear scope and sequence. So I think we would consider meet the criteria for what we would want in a curriculum, which is I want to be able to go from the beginning to the end. And at the end, I have taught all of the skills within that curriculum. So the two we're going to be talking about for the rest of the episode are the PEERS curriculum, the Program for the Evaluation and Enrichment of Relational Skills, which came first, the acronym, or the meaning of the acronym there. 
And that was by, by Logason. And that was back in, I think, uh, original study was 2009. But we're going to be talking about the 2012 study, which is sort of a, another a replication with a little bit more data involved, which looks at improving friendship quality and ecologically valid social skills among adolescents with higher functioning ASD. And at the time of this publication had seven articles ranging from active treatment comparison. There's some randomized control trials. There have also been some replications other than written by Elizabeth Logason, the original author of the Peers curriculum, which I appreciated because I know when I looked into Peers on my own like a year and a half ago, all I could find were research publications by Logason, which sort of gave me that weird feeling of, okay, but what other people say that aren't financially invested in the curriculum you've put together. No, no, if, I mean, I don't, I don't want to cast aspersions on her or anything, but I think that is a meaningful question to ask. Oh, yeah. I mean, when I talk to my students about evidence-based practice and we practice looking for red flags, we like go on the internet and, and look up things. That's one of the red flags is if no one else has published on that topic except for the author. It may still be good research. We just need more research to support it other than that lab. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Coming in second is the Social Competence Intervention, SCI, by Stichter. And that had five studies. And this is a cognitive behavior therapy program on social skills related to perspective taking, decoding facial expressions, conversation skills, and then problem solving. But also did mention the use of behavior analytic techniques in the development of the treatment, which, you know, again, I think peaked our ears as, oh, this seems nice. So... We're going to take a little break because we've been, I've been talking a long time. And when we come back, Jackie and Diana are going to give us a little bit of a rundown on these two most researched social skills curricula. But first, a break. We'll be right back. Do you want to be a BCBA? Sure, we all do. Now you can come to Regis College in Weston, Mass. to get your graduate degree. Choose from any one of these courses. Masters of Science in Applied Behavior Analysis. Masters of Science in Special Education. Dual degree in Special Ed and ABA. Or be eligible for your post-master certificate. You can complete your degree and be ready to sit for the exam in two years. And our 2017 grads had a 100% pass rate on the BACB exam. Come enjoy practicum placement support, ethics mini handbooks, PhD level professors, small class sizes, and a service trip to Iceland. If interested, don't delay. Supplies are limited. Learn more at regiscollege.edu. Again, that's www.regiscollege.edu. Regiscollege.edu. One more time, www.regiscollege.edu. See you there. And we're back talking about social skills curricula. But first, did you know that ABA Inside Track is ACE approved? Well, hey, it is. And by listening to the show, you're able to earn one learning credit. All you need to do is listen to the whole episode, then go to our website at abainsidetrack.com slash getceus. That's G-E-T hyphen C-E-U-S. And put in some information, including two secret code words we've hidden throughout the episode. I'm going to give you the first one now. It is yoga. Y-O-G-A. It's the exercise slash meditation slash lifestyle activity where you bend around a lot. I did yoga once and it was just unpleasant. I did not care for it. It was hot yoga. It was much too hot. Yeah, you need to try a different yoga. I don't like that yoga. I don't like taking like take my shoes off in places. Like, it weirded me out. It was sliding all over the place. No, thank you. Yoga. All right, and we're back. Now let's continue our conversation about social skills curricula. So we had the two top researched social skills curricula. Now, being top research does not mean that they are the top programs of all time. It just means that there have been research studies related to do these two curricula, the peers and the SCI curricula, actually teach what they purport to teach to individuals with ASD. So let's start with the most researched of the two, the peers curriculum. And we'll talk about, again, an an older study by the original author. So Diana, take it away. Tell us, won't you? I unfortunately have not had a chance to actually run the peers curriculum myself, although now I do see the book and the book looks 
nice. It's very nice. Not published by Pearson, which was what I was anticipating. Published by Rutledge instead. So can't speak to what it's like to run the program, but I will walk you through what it was like for the Laugesons team to run the program, and you guys can come to your own conclusions. Now, as we get started in talking about this, I do want to highlight for anyone out there who has watched the Love on the Spectrum series on Netflix, which follows, I don't know, maybe like six, six to seven different autistic young adults in Australia looking to establish relationships. The program that they're doing there was developed by Elizabeth Laugesson and is tied into the Peers program. So... There will be some overlap in what I review here as what you saw on that show, but that was specifically related to how does one learn how to go on a date and develop a romantic relationship slash friendship, whereas this curriculum was more focused specifically on just establishing friendships for teens. So that's another check in the box for endorsing the peers curricula because it was on Netflix? No, (laughs) no. I was just trying to give people a point of reference for what this might look like and not to fully endorse the Love on the Spectrum series either. I think that it was really enlightening, but there were some challenges as well in the presentation for for that. But that probably is a discussion for another time. So the time of Rob's study, the Hall study, there have been seven studies evaluating peers. So that does put it as one of the most researched social skill packages. And the study that I'm going to review is the Laugeson 2012 study, which was a replication of some of their previous work. So it's not the first one, but it was an interesting one that gave a lot of detail on what they did. So that's why we chose this one. And it was designed as a once a week meeting that went across 14 weeks. And the focus was, like I had said, establishing friendships and decreasing loneliness were the things that they were purporting to work on because they were highlighting in the introduction here that even having one or two friends can really help to you know, inoculate one against some of the more concerning components of being alone, experiencing depression, anxiety, et cetera. So for me, I want to know how did the participants feel about this? Like, did they consider this to be a problem? Did they want to develop more friendships? And that's never discussed within this article. I, I don't know, Rob, if it's in your book yet. I mean, I mean there, there have been other, other replications, even the past year, looking at using peers in other parts of the world. But I don't know offhand how much more feedback was received from the the students who took part in the in the research. I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, it's, it's very correlational, right? You say like, well, you know, maybe this person doesn't have a lot of friends and they seem lonely and depressed, but we don't necessarily know if they feel lonely and depressed because they don't have friends or if they aren't concerned about that. And there are other things in their life that may be contributing to loneliness or depression. So that's not a causal relationship here, but the researchers are anticipating that by building friendships that one is more socially Connected, has a better support system, has someone that they could bring problems to, et cetera, that should hopefully decrease the higher rates of depression and anxiety that are often seen in the autistic population. One thing I did like about the study is that they brought in the parents. So this was a concurrently operating training in which they had parents attending a training and the adolescents attending a training at the same time, but they were two separate trainings. So they gave each of them information to then go back and use and practice during the week. They met back up in the following week and did it all over again with a new topic. So the peers program was building upon a previous study that they had also done at their group called the Children's Friendship Training Program or the CFT. And that was published by Frankel and Myatt in 2003. So it was intended for sort of younger audiences. <laughs> and then this was their interpretation for the adolescent crowd. So they wanted to incorporate parent training. They wanted to build upon the, the CFT. And they also wanted to conduct this study as a randomized controlled trial. So the way that they did that was they divided their participants into two groups. One group, uh, everyone got a baseline. One group received the 14 weeks of training immediately. The other group received the 14 weeks of training next, right? So they only had so many slots, basically. 
but they were randomly assigned to which got which group, and then they measured their results at that midpoint in time, and then at the end of the, the second 14 weeks. Included in each of the groups were 14 adolescents, so there was 28 participants in total. They were aged 12 to 17 years. 23 were male, five were female, all had some type of ASD diagnosis. Some of them had additional diagnoses as well, such as ADHD or depression. And the inclusion criteria for this study was that their parents reported social problems for the participants. We don't have information about how the participants felt about their social standing. The participants were willing to participate, so we have that, but we don't know again, what their treatment goals were for themselves, and that they had an IQ of at least 70. There was a lot of verbal review of the skills in the study. There was a lot of instruction following. The participants were asked to build rules themselves of social situations, and there was a lot of opportunity for modeling and role play. So they were looking for participants that could participate in all of those activities. And they tested about a thousand things as their dependent variables. So this study is, there's no graph, guys, right? So like that's, that was a little bit of a letdown for me because this is how I read articles, right? You read the intro, I'm sorry, you read the abstract, and then you flip to the graph because you want to know what happened in the study. And I'm flipping and I'm flipping and I'm like, oh my God, there's no graph. And I go back and I look at the abstract again and then I, and I was like, oh no, I think they did statistics. And I start flipping through. I was like, no, there's the statistical tables. There's no graph. So that was a little bit of a letdown. But it is important as well to think wanting these types of research and studies to reach larger audiences. Not everyone uses visual inspection of data the way that we love to. So they chose instead to examine changes in behavior using a variety of questionnaires that they asked the parents to fill out and on some occasions the participants' teachers to fill out. So those included the social skills rating system, the social responsiveness scale, the quality of play questionnaire. I was like, that seems kind of odd for these 12 to 17-year-olds, but they checked to see did they, or they asked the parents, did they have any get-togethers during the week? And then how did they get along with the other person if they came over? So that's how they used that one. The test of adolescent social skills knowledge, the Kaufman Brief Intelligence Test, and the Vineland 2. So they did all those battery of assessments at baseline. But again, they were really just asking the parents for the most part, how did they do on these? The, t- the test of adolescent social skills knowledge revised, the task R, that was the specifically created for the peers curriculum. So it's like the test at the end of the curricula, it's a multiple choice test. Like there's a copy of it in the, in the version I have. So it's, you know, it's, it's not to say I'm sure we've all made something that we, you know, had a test, we made a curricula or we made a training and then we had a test and everyone failed the test. And we realized, I don't think our test actually measured what we thought we were training. So it is important, but at the same time, you're, you're hoping the students at the end of the class will get, you know, a hundred on the test when it's referring to exactly what was just taught. It's a little different than the other questionnaires in that, in that regard. Yeah, and in this case, one would hope that you would get those questions correct as they're the things that they were practicing during the week, but they did need to interpret them then into those types of multiple choice answers. But yeah, thanks for that. And what they did was they, like I said, they had the parent and the participant come in. This is when you could meet in person for things. And the sessions were 90 minutes. So there was one parent that was designated as like, what did they call them? The pre-designated parent. So that person always needed to come, but the other parents or other caregivers were welcome to come as well if they wanted to. The other parents had been drinking. You had to have at least one who could still parent. (laughs) And although there were 14 participants in each group, they did note that the the group size when they were there for the social skills groups was only eight to 10. So then I read that and I was like, wait a minute, it said 14. And then I thought about it and I said, oh, that must mean that this was run multiple times. Right. So they didn't do all 14 at once. It was just like an ongoing thing. So it was 14 weeks, came in once a week for 90 minutes. And in order to be included in the study, you had to attend at least 11 of the 14 weeks. They didn't note if anyone was removed for that reason. And the group leaders for the study sessions were licensed clinical psychologists. They all had experience running these social skills groups before. And then they each had two coaches is what they were called, that assisted the group leaders as well so that they could go around and give folks feedback and answer questions and things like that. And the way that the lessons were set up, the way that they described them was 
in quotes, a psychoeducational and cognitive behavioral treatment technique is what they called it. But it broke down to look not dissimilar to how we might describe behavioral skills training in that they had instructions, role play, modeling, and feedback built into the lessons there. So every week there was homework that they needed to do. The first thing they did when they came back was review the lesson from last week, review the homework that had been assigned, and troubleshoot any questions that came up. Then they presented the new lesson, so the new topic for the day, that included a role play demonstration, and then the adolescents rehearsed the skill and got feedback for the parents. They did not have them rehearse the skill, but they had a handout with information for them, and they reviewed it together. And for the parents, they talked about how they could facilitate practice for this skill with their child at home during the week. And they talked about the social rules associated with the skills, if they were relevant. And I thought this was an interesting way to put it. They said they reviewed the rules established as, in quotes, the norm established by socially accepted teens. So they're trying to say this is how the other kids at school would respond to this, basically. And, you know, it hits back home to that point I made earlier, which is, These are sort of the socially accepted norms and rules. Does that mean that that is how social interaction has to go? No, it really doesn't. But it's how most people in the world are engaging in social interaction. So do we need to require everyone to engage in social interaction that way? Could we be more flexible in what we consider to be appropriate social interaction? Very likely. And I think that's why it's really important to gain the input of autistic individuals when we're attempting to establish these types of curricula. But they would present a scenario. They'd say, okay, well, let's practice. And I'm going to tell you what all these are. And some of them are, you know, like, how would I come into this conversation, right? I want to discuss what they're talking about. How can I join the conversation? So there probably are some rules in order to do that, right? So they would have them practice. And if it didn't go great, they'd say, okay, what maybe went wrong in this situation? How could you approach it differently? And they had the the teens as a group come up with a social rule which I really liked, and they liked too. (laughs) They said that that worked well because that allowed them to to generate their own rules based on the situation and do so in their own language. So like one of the examples was don't be a conversation hog. That was like how how the teens decided to to do the rule themselves. And that was working really well for them because they, many of them like to have those types of social rules and follow them. And then they were assigned the homework for the next week. So that was how the 90 minutes was spent. And now I'm just going to tell you the 14 skills which were assigned to the weeks. Number one, introductions and trading information, so how to go back and forth. Number two, conversation skills. Number three, electronic communication, so emails and texting. I love that one, right? I do too. These are appropriate for so many people to work on. Number four, choosing appropriate friends. Number five, appropriate use of humor. Number six, peer entry strategies. That was the joining conversations one. Number seven, peer exit strategies. So exiting a conversation. Number eight, get togethers. Number nine, good sportsmanship. Number 10, handling teasing. Number 11, handling bullying and bad reputations. And I'll just note, I forgot to say before, in the 2009 paper, there were 12 weeks. So they added two and the bullying was one of the ones they added. Week 12, handling arguments and disagreements. Week 13, handling rumors and gossip. That was the other one that they added. And then week 14 was a graduation party, which they got to practice some of these skills as a group. So, I mean, just imagine like trying to cover the entire topic of conversation skills in 90 minutes. That seems too much <laughs> to do. So, you know, I'm glad that you said that, Rob, about the 30 hours it seems like a lot to try to cover social skills in 30 hours. I would agree these are 90 minutes times 14, which I didn't do that math ahead of time, but it's probably like 21 hours. So that's just not very much time at all to practice some of these skills, particularly given that there's a lot of nuance in knowing how to respond to these complex situations. But that's what they did. It's 1,260 minutes. So 21 hours. Oh, thanks. I got it. And then they checked in. With parents, basically, and said, how, you know, from baseline now, how do you see changes for your teen? The parents who were in the treatment group reported the greater change in social skills on the SSRP. They noted decreased challenges in social responsiveness on the SRS. The 
Participants themselves showed improved social skills knowledge following treatment on the task R. And the parents reported them hosting more get-togethers. And then they asked the teachers how they did on the SSRS, but they didn't get a lot of responses back on that, which is too bad because it would have been nice to have someone outside of who had not participated in the study to get that information. But the ones that they got back said they saw a positive change. And that's what we know about the results, right? But we don't have a ton of information as far as the way that we normally would collect data, looking at role plays or actual interactions between the peers or the teens on how they did on the individual skills. Now, that would, to me, be a big limitation, right? That they were mostly relying on parent report as their outcome measure. They also know that they didn't get long-term outcome measures. For the first group that went first, they got the 14-week later results. But for the second group, they couldn't do that. So they don't even have like 14 weeks later results for them. And then for me, I think the biggest, for me, glaring absence here is how did the participants feel about the skills that they were being taught? Did they consider them to be skills that they wanted to improve in? And did they think that the training was socially valid? I know in the the manual I have, which is for, for teachers or for use in school rather than for parents, it, it sort of it still has some of the parent components, but not as many. It has a few more skills. It does either do like weekly lessons, like daily lessons or the weekly lesson like they did in this 2012 study. It does recommend that you only have students join a peer's class group if they are interested in working on social skills and making and maintaining friendships. So, oh, good. So that, that is a component. Like it says in the book, like if someone doesn't want to be there, don't make them go to the class because they won't like it and they will make the experience less pleasant for everybody and it won't be effective. Okay, good. I'm glad to hear that, that that was in there. Maybe it just got, you know cut in the editing process or something like that. That happens sometimes. And again, I mean, it may not have been in the original. I mean, they don't mention it in the 2012 study. It may have just been an addition in some of the later research, you know, or or or, or you're right, Diana, like just didn't get mentioned because, hey, they came all the way to UCLA to join our group. So I assume they're here because, you know, th- they want well, to be here. their parents thought it was important. Yeah. And they said they were willing to participate. Yeah. But I would have liked a little more than that. So it was a good start, right? And, and, we know that the peers program is generally highly regarded, but I want more. Mm-hmm. I want more. And some of it's that's a, what I want. Some of it's a confound of our own episode, and that we wanted to pick older research that would discuss the makings of the program rather than mm-hmm. more recent research, which is like we use the peers curriculum. Look at other research if you want to hear about it. Here's our randomized control design, and then we just be reading you a bunch of statistics, which no one wants to hear over their podcast player anyway. So <laughs> so they're a little bit, it's a little bit older research that has a little, little more narrative, I think, that will allow you, the listener, to kind of make up your mind as to what more you want to learn as well. So thank you, Diana. So let's move into our second most researched social skills curriculum, the SCI program. Jackie, you you looked at this at this article in a little more depth. So this this study looked at a social, they call it a social competence intervention. And it is a slight deviation from the curriculum that you were talking about, Rob, because what they have done is they realize that the curriculum, the SCI, was geared toward adolescents and it didn't really fit, you know, for everyone. So what they wanted to do is look at different research and make it a modified version for elementary school students. And so when they were talking about how they were going to modify this, they went back to look at the developmental literature, which I really appreciated, and how it's changed from the older curriculum. So they're working on slightly the same skills, but the instructions in, is in short bursts. Each week, they review what they learned the following week. And then when they're learning a new skill, it's all about active learning and role play, which I really appreciated. And they said that for younger learners, guided practice and instruction and specifically teaching strategies on how to learn and maintain these skills is how they've changed the assessment in the curricula. And so for this current study, they wanted to expand on social competence for elementary age students. So they were looking to see if there was any post-intervention gains specifically on the skills of theory of mind identifying emotions through facial recognition and executive functioning. So I like that they told us very specifically what they were looking at. 
I thought that was, you know, a good skill. I mean, a good, you know, overall theme of this this study. So the curriculum was conducted at a university affiliated outpatient treatment center somewhere in the Midwest. So they had a 20 hour group intervention for 10 weeks, which is not a lot, right? Where we had small groups and the groups had no more than seven participants. So the lowest group was four participants. The highest was seven participants. And in order to be included in this curricula, participants must have had a diagnosis of PDD and and or autism or related disability, be between the ages of six and 10, which still seems kind of wide, right? Like a six-year-old and a 10-year-old have vastly different skills, but it worked out for them a little bit, and have normal IQ access around 70. And here they said that they must have access to neurotypical peers at least part of the day. So participants were recruited via flyer or by their service provider knowledge that this is something that they would want to work on. And so overall, there was 20 participants that were included in the study. 19 were male, aging around eight and seven years old. And they participated across two cohorts across three academic semesters. So not a ton of time, right? So you think the the skills that they're looking at take a while to teach. So like theory of mind facial recognition, executive functioning. Those are huge topics that they tried to, you know, condense into five units for one-hour lessons across two weeks. And so they laid out some specific skills that they looked at, recognizing facial expression, sharing ideas, turn-taking, recognizing feelings of yourself and of others, and then some problem-solving strategies. And so each session started with reviewing old skills, introducing those new skills by providing a ver- verbal instruction as well as written instructions and visual prompts on how to engage in those skills. Then they modeled those skills and then they practiced both in the in- instructional setting and in the natural setting throughout the week. And then each session ended with a closing activity and a review of what they've done. And prior to this study, which was different from the original, SCI was that they specifically taught what they called rules of the road, which they thought were necessary prior to engaging in these other skills, which were greeting others, making eye contact, and initiating conversations with others. So these are the things that they taught prior to starting this curriculum. Another deviation from the original curriculum was that each individual had their own contingencies at play for engaging in the behavior that they desired. And then they had a group contingency that was added on after, but they didn't specify what those were for any of the participants. And in fact, I thought it was interesting that this is the only place where they say that there was feedback given. I don't know like what sort of feedback or what sort of contingencies, right? But that wasn't specific about when they were practicing the skills, if they got any feedback from whoever was teaching. But yeah, so I don't know what those contingencies are, and I'm not sure if they were given for a specific skill or just being present for the lesson or going to the lesson, right? So that might be helpful for clinicians to know. But, you know, in my experience, probably start small, work up, right? And working on those specific skills. So their measures were fairly similar to to what Diana talked about in the, the peers program, where they did a a whole battery of different assessments, and they did it two weeks before the curriculum started and then two weeks after. And the battery of assessments usually lasted between 70 to 90 minutes. And so they looked at student performance across social, they call it social responsiveness, theory of mind, emotional, emotion recognition, and executive functioning. And then they also had caregivers, one caregiver and one teacher complete a questionnaire on each of these skills. And so when they looked at social abilities, they were looking at a social responsiveness scale. The theory of mind, they use the Sally Ann test as well as the Smarties test. And they added one at the end, which was called the faux pas stories. I like the faux pas stories. Yeah. And so this they used to identify potentially embarrassing situations or, you know, when you get into a little a rut, like in a social situation, could they... Could the participants identify those issues? They looked at an assessment of nonverbal recognition, looking at facial recognition, as well as reading. They used the reading in mind's eyes test. 
So can you tell how someone's feeling by looking at their eyes in specific pictures? And then when they did executive functioning, the parent just completed the questionnaire and did some tests on some problem solving. Could their child engage in specific tasks related to problem solving? And similar to our Diana's, again, they used a pair sample t-test obtained pre and post and looked at effect sizes. And, you know, we saw the biggest gains when we looked at parent reports. So parents reported that there was bigger improvements in social abilities and executive functioning post-training, so two weeks following the completion of the program. And then the second biggest gain was seen, again, in social abilities and executive functioning through the lens of the teacher report but it wasn't as large as the parent report, so it was more modest. And sadly for me, the student performance levels did not meet statistically important levels, so that was kind of sad, right? So when they actually looked at could the student, did the student do better on these assessments before their intervention or after, and the answer was no, which was a little bit bummer. But they did see some increase in sequencing problem solving, like, okay, what happened first? What happened second? What happened third? And they actually saw a decrease in skill development on the theory of mind tasks and on measures of emotional recognition, which I actually wasn't that surprised about because when looking at what they taught in the assessment, I'm not sure they match up all that much. And so that was one of the limitations of this curricula is that it's potential that. The students did make progress, but the pre and post assessments that they were using didn't accurately capture what they were looking at. And that would kind of highlight because they did see a slight increase in accuracy in the faux pas tests. And that was one of the things that they were teaching in the lesson. So that seemed to relate more closely. And so the authors, you know, said, you know, we saw some good results, but it's not like the best. So we need some more research. And then they talked about why they might have not seen such great results. And 10 weeks isn't really that long, like we talked about. And one hour for, you know, every week is also not that long to teach these pretty complex skills. So they said that it might be more beneficial to look at a skill-based performance measure or maybe make each lesson longer and more complex. And then also look at the different measurements to actually capture what was taught in the curriculum and not these these battery of assessments that didn't really relate to the specific skills that they taught in the curriculum. Yes. I think that they were trying to teach so many things in such a short period of time. I mean, it seems it's good that the things that they were actually teaching, they saw progress on some of those. But I mean, I wouldn't expect a child who hasn't performed well on the Sally Ann test to learn that through talking about other social skills for one hour a week across 10 weeks and then suddenly to come back and to be able to do the Sally Ann test. It, it, it almost seems to me like they threw so much stuff at them that maybe they were then more confused about how to read some of these social cues than they were previously because they didn't have time to really learn some of those discriminative stimuli. Right. And five units is a lot of units, right? Like, And they're young. <laughs> they're young kids mm. as well. Yeah. Right. I think the youngest, they had a six and a half year old in the program. Mm -hmm. Well, so now we've had a chance to sort of do a, a brief review. And I mean, th this episode's going a little long, but it probably could go a heck of a lot longer when we're talking about, you know, the, the breadth of skill being reviewed in all of this literature. But it, it is a sample. It's a good place to start. And I think kind of where we are, it's probably a good place to check in Good place to stop. <laughs> it's good place to yeah, Jay, it's a good place to stop at our dissemination station. Here we are. So we chose the articles that we discussed mainly because they had a nice summary of research and also because they captured, I think, some of the early goings on in the, the development of both of these curricula. So since then, and, and we certainly recommend anyone who's interested in social skill curricula to look at the Bellini article, to look at the Hall article as well, because that has just table upon table of different currently available curricula for social skill training for students with ASD. So you could look at that and sort of, you know, look at some of the research, look what's out there. Certainly the peers curriculum as it had sort of the most research behind it that I was able to look at kind of in my own kind of professional 
my day job, I was able to pick it up on Amazon. I think it was like 50 bucks. It was pretty cheap just to look through. And and I think is very much in line with most of what I've seen in previous research on social skill training in behavior analytic journals in terms of modeling, use of feedback, use of role play. I kind of wish there was a little bit more use of feedback than some of the modeling, but they do put some fun scripts in the book. So it's all about kind of trying to make sure that the the participants are having a good time or don't think it's completely stupid that they're attending this this training. Some of the scripts are a little hokey, but not not too bad. I'm a little bit far from being an adolescent though, so what, what do I know? Since the articles that we discussed, there have been more research studies, so about seven as of the writing of the Hall article that had looked at both peers for in I think you know in, in randomized control trials and comparison studies, peers in Korea. There was one on peers in Japan and modifications that needed to be made for peers to be effective for you know individuals living in Japan having you know different you know social skills being being different than they are. In, at UCLA or in California, you know, other results looking at, you know, reports of decreased anxiety, decreased problem behaviors. They actually did have some studies that looked at video models and did demonstrate generalization of some of the skills in terms of the vocal expressiveness and quality of rapport as rated by these video samples of students who had been in the peers group. So there have been some studies that did look a little bit more at specific skills and how the skills were demonstrated, not just reports. They did have some of the teens themselves report on how many get-togethers they were having, how they felt their communication skills were after. So again, there has been more advanced research on the peers' curriculum. Similarly with SCI, they've looked at a couple other issues since the 2012 study. They've certainly looked again at doing some school-based studies, looking at more teacher report of you know skills related to, say, executive functioning, social skills during lunchtime. So they did try to look at were the skills being used at a time outside of the running of the curriculum itself. There was also a randomized control trial uh, showing that SCI had some moderate effect sizes in terms of capacity to interact socially with teachers and peers and awareness of social cues. Again, I think one of the challenges we run into is that when we're just looking at reports and when we're looking at the ways things are phrased, there's always that question of, well, is that really demonstrating a social skill or is that just talking about a social skill? And when we look at both of these as sort of the front runners in terms of research about programs, I think that still remains a bit of a limitation, maybe a little bit less so than these original publications, but a bit of a limitation in terms of, are these the skills that are the most important? And are they resulting in meaningful, observable change? Or is this so much improvement in verbal behavior related to social skills? So I think we're always very cognizant of that being being a difference that doesn't always get reported in the research because it is a lot easier, especially outside of behavior analysis, to do a lot of checklists. And while there is merit to those, it is not always exactly what we would like to see to really say, yes, this program is leading to the changes that it is purporting to teach or or the skills it is purporting to teach across various settings, across different people. So that would be one thing I know I would like to see in in future research. How about, you know, the the two of you in terms of what's still missing for you in the research that you've, you know, reviewed in your own and reviewed as, as part of this episode? I think, I know Diana has said it a few times, so I think it's important to consider the social validity of the curricula, right? So ask, asking, you know, those that the curricula is affecting directly, are these the skills that you see that are going to be beneficial for you in your life? I think even at the elementary age level, we can, we can ask those questions and make sure that we're tailoring our teaching to what's going to be most important to the person. And I know that you know, as a parent and, you know, working with parents, parents tend to really want what's best for their kids and want them to have friends and want them to, you know, really be good at their jobs. And I I think working as a collaborative team with the caregivers and whoever is, you know, helping that student out, as well as the student and making sure that we're teaching skills that are that are going to be advantageous for that specific student while drawing on their strengths too. And then one other thing that's completely different than that is I just want to see more individual data, right? So, you know, if they have 50 students, I want to I want to see data from one student, right? I want to see how they're progressing because again, you know, statistical significance is great, but if one person did really well and one person did really badly, it's not helping me know is this the curricula that I want to use. 
in terms of crafting, you know, how how could this run in a school? I know one of the areas that I was interested in was not just looking at the questionnaires, not just looking at the SRS, the task R, you know, the questionnaires that were sort of a part of the pre and post test assessment. I really wanted to look at sort of skills that either the students in in conjunction with their parents and their teachers had determined were relevant for their own social skill development. I wanted to see, hey, we're already got a report on those skills as, as part of social skill development. Say if a student has an individualized education plan, wouldn't we love to look at they use the peers curriculum? Where were they on those skills before? Where are they after? You know, it's sort of a, a measure of something that has some amount of social validity because for those objectives to be proposed and accepted, they have to be proposed and accepted by the parent and depending on the age of the student might have to be also accepted by the student, him or herself or themselves. So looking at some more specific individualized data as well, I thought that really would be kind of a match made in heaven in terms of that data has to get collected somehow. Why don't we collect it as part of probes related to, you know, concerted effort to work on those skills as part of a structured curricula, which then meets, I think, some of the previous recommendations in terms of it happening enough, happening in the settings that are the most relevant and happening across locations rather than just in the context of the peers classroom or the SCI classroom or the social skills classroom, whatever curricula you end up using. So to be determined how much some of that's able to to go about, COVID times are really tough to (laughs) start new initiatives. So we'll have to see whether I I can get any firsthand data to share with you all in the future. I didn't really bury the lead on my dissemination station when I led with the things I thought should be continued to look at with social skills curricula. But, and I, I mentioned the love on the spectrum episode and I learned a lot by watching that because I just had a lot of opportunity in that to follow the stories of these individuals and see how they interacted. And I found that when I was watching, there were some times where the two people were having a conversation and I felt like, Oh gosh, this is an awkward pause. This feels like a very awkward pause right now, but but neither of the two of them as reflected in their behavior on the screen seemed to feel like it was an awkward pause, right? So I was like, well maybe that's just something that I feel based on, you know, my social norms and sort of how I'm put together that this is awkward, but they seem completely fine regarding this, right? Or there would be times where they would say goodbye to one another and they would just be like, bye. And there was none of this like long drawn out, like, oh, this was so great. It was so great to see you. Like, when are we going to see each other again? Like, none of that seemed important or relevant, right? It was just like, bye. But then there were other times in those conversations where one individual had like a special interest that he wanted to share with the person he was on a date with. And they seemed like they got along great on the date. But then at the end of it, he said, well, she didn't like my special interest. So it's over. And if I'm remembering correctly, like she felt the same way about her special interests. Like they, and the special interests were not that different either, but they weren't the exact special interests that one another had. I was like, well, in that situation, maybe one would want to maybe practice a little bit talking about someone else's special interest so that you could have this type of conversation with one another, right? So, and maybe they saw it that way and maybe they weren't able to make the connection because they didn't have that piece. So I would just be very interested to, take this all apart and say, what pieces of this are just what our society has laid on, what a connection is, right, that are sort of expected to be there, and what are the actual components that are 100% necessary to to build a connection with someone if that is what you're looking to do. And I think that it could be really different from the way that we currently think about it, and we need a lot more input and data in order to build the best systems that we can. So step one, make something that we can do regularly with some procedural integrity. And then step two, see how it goes in the future as to meaningful outcomes. Man, social skills. I felt like at the beginning of the episode and planning for the episodes, like we're going to be in a good part. Now I sort of feel like, man, there's it's like nothing. still feels like a vast wasteland in terms of all the things that need to happen. You can't even agree on like, this is what we're going to work on is the skills. And then looking at all the other pieces, you're you, you know, you're, you're bringing up Diana, which are so important in terms of what, what is meaningful, you know, and, and, and meaningful can't be judged in the moment. It's also got to be judged by in the future. Cause while it is important that individuals have a say in terms of what their socialization is going to look like, we also have to understand that that rule about, you know, social norms is going to shift as time goes on. And, and really at the end of the day, do you have meaningful friendships? 
Do you have mental health issues around having or not having meaningful friendships? Are you able to maintain your job because you have the social skills required to stay in that job in addition to the actual job skills? Oh, it's just so much. It's so much. But we're running out of time, so we'll have to end where we are here. So again, some good research for you all to take a look at to see what you feel about it. Again, the Pierce curriculum is not too expensive. I haven't had a chance to look into the, the SCI by Stichter, though she did send me a nice kind of a one-sheet summary of sort of the program at, I believe it's the University of Missouri, actually, that she works out of. So, you know, I'm interested in, in getting a little bit more information on sort of some of the updates there. And who knows, if, if folks are interested and would like to hear us do a follow-up on this at some point in the future. We might look at some of the more recent studies and see how these curricula have been further developed as time has gone on and have they answered more of the questions that really hadn't been a part of the of the Hall review. So always more to come when it comes to improving curricula. But for now, that'll bring us to the end of the show. I want to say a big thank you to all of you listeners out there for listening to the podcast. If you liked it, why not subscribe to the show? We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you like to get your podcast. It would mean so very much to us if you leave us a review on any of those sites to let us know what you think. There are a couple other ways that you can reach out and get in touch with us here as well. Certainly, you can go to our website, abainsidetrack.com, where we have links to all of the articles discussed in this episode, as well as a link to purchase CEs for any of our full-length episodes. You can also find these po- episodes posted on YouTube with the YouTube subtitling feature. There's also a bunch of ways to reach us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram as ABA Inside Track. And if you like our discussions and would like a little bit more, maybe a little bit more fun zany talk, well, you could find us on our Patreon page, patreon.com slash ABA Inside Track, where we do bi-monthly social meetups, as well as extra long book club podcasts. We have three of those a year worth two learning credits and also discounts for patrons at the $10 and up level. But to join in on those social meetups, it's only $5 to subscribe. So we hope to see you there in one of our future meetups. And finally, you can reach us at any time at abainsidetrack at gmail.com. One last piece of information you're also going to want to share with us if you're interested in those CEs, and that's the second secret code word. And it is DOG, D-O-G, a code word that I was shocked, shocked, I say, to know we had never used before. I think we've used a variety of other words (laughs) related to, but never exactly DOG, the four-legged friend, D-O-G, DOG. In addition to thanking all of you listeners, I want to make sure to thank Jackie and Diana for their fabulous co-hosting. I also want to thank Dr. Jim Carr for his intro and outro theme song recording, Kyle Sturry for his interstitial music, Dan Thabit of the Podcast Doctors for his editing, and Hollis Irvin of the Sycamore Workshop for his visual design. We'll be back next week with another full-length episode, but until then, keep responding. Bye! Bye! Bye.